it's fair to say that there was a lot more interest in last year's draft. We pretty much knew the top three picks. Obviously, the Trey Lance thing was kind of a curveball, but we had so much information on this quarterback heavy class. But look, you could argue that this draft is actually more exciting because we really don't know the first pick, let alone what comes after that. I know you think it's Aiden Hutchinson to Jacksonville. Can you explain that prediction? Yeah, I agree with that. That I honestly think this draft's more intriguing. I get that there's less interest, eight teams without a first round pick. That's obviously going to drive that down. But I, I might not get a single pick right in my mock draft. That, that's how crazy this draft Ooh. could go because I, I think it's going to be Aiden Hutchinson. I think he should be the number one overall pick. He very well may not be, though. They, they can fall in love with Trayvon Walker, the Georgia edge rusher, and sort of the physical tools that he has because, I mean, for a 270 pounder, he, he's more athletic or tested out more athletic at least. Than someone like Miles Garrett, who obviously you know is an elite edge rusher in the NFL, but but I think it's going to be Aiden Hutchinson because one that Jacksonville staff, mainly Trent Baalke at GM, who everyone you know every Jags fan was calling for his head all off season, wanted him gone. The clown mask, the clown emojis all over Twitter that you saw calling for him to be gone. He needs to hit on this pick. You know he doesn't have to wait for a Trayvon Walker to develop. He doesn't have that time. You need the best player. You need a guy who's going to impact. In 2022, to me, that's Aiden Hutchinson. He was the best, obviously, defender, defensive player in college football last year. Invited to the Heisman ceremony. And, like, his athleticism itself is getting slept on, in my opinion. He's a high-end agility athlete for the position. His three-cone, his short shuttle at the combine were elite times for a guy his size. In fact, like, the, he had the second-best weight-adjusted three-cone uh, since the combine started, since we've been tracking combine data since 2000, number one on that list is JJ Watt. So that's good company to be in athletically if you're talking about a guy with no one overall pick. So that's my take on it. But like I said, I still have no idea if they're actually going to go through with that. The first, uh, the first QB you have going is Malik Willis from Liberty, going sixth overall to Carolina. What separated him from the pack, in your opinion? What are you hearing to justify that? It's the tools. It's arm strength. I mean, whether it's on tape, you see it from the pocket, outside the pocket, wherever you want it. He also had the fastest uh, miles per hour at the Senior Bowl, fast miles per hour at the Combine. The dude has can. So he has that, and he also can run. He's mobile. Uh, he broke more tackles than Kenneth Walker did last year at Liberty. And, yeah, it's a lower level of competition, but he is elusive. He's going to be in that tier one of runners at the quarterback position, like, like a Josh Allen, like a Kyler Murray, and what he can add on to your running game and what he can do as a scrambler. So. Those are good starting points for a quarterback. You've also seen him make improvements over the course of his career. He takes to coaching well, is a good kid by every measure. You saw the, you know, the picture of him at the combine giving a uh, homeless man his sneakers. Like he, he is, by all accounts, a guy you want to bet on going forward. And that's what the NFL, that, that's what the NFL drafts highlight. And that's what the NFL covets is the guy that can take you to the highest end. Like if you're in the AFC right now with an average quarterback, trying to go up against Deshaun Watson, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, you don't have a chance. Joe Burrow, like, you need the high-end plays. So he brings those to the table where other guys in this quarterback class may not. Now, to be fair, you don't think there's any reason to take him or any quarterback higher than six because quarterbacks typically get overdrafted. Yes, they get overdrafted. They're going to be overdrafted this year's draft. This is the lowest we're going to have the top quarterback on the PFF draft board since we started doing draft boards in 2016. We haven't had a quarterback lower than 10th. That was Mitch Trubisky back 20, was that 17 draft. And we're going to have Malik Willis, I think he's 27th. And that's the first quarterback on the PFF draft board. So we are decidedly low on this quarterback class. Last year, like we talked about last year off the top, I think five quarterbacks would have gone before Malik Willis last year. Like Mac Jones would have still gone before Malik Willis right. if he was in last year's class. You mentioned Mitch Trubisky. Uh, he obviously signed with the Steelers. They have some big shoes to fill with Big Ben retiring. But do you think they're interested in still taking a quarterback in the first round? Maybe let Kenny Pickett stay put at that facility? Oh, they're interested. I, I mean, we were down mm -hmm. at the Senior Bowl uh, watching Mike Tomlin hawking these quarterbacks, following their every move. He's reportedly taken every single one of the top guys out to dinner prior to their pro days. He has been watching these guys doing all the due diligence possible. Now, do they still take one? TBD. I mean, like, he could do all that due diligence and come to the fact that they all stink. Like, that's a very that's right. real possibility in this quarterback class. But I do think that any of these guys, I'd rather have than Mr. Biscuit at this point. So it's like, it's the Ooh. sort of, compared to what they have on the roster, that still might be an upgrade, even if it's a quarterback three in this draft class.
So you were saying, I just wanted to clarify, you said Malik Willis, he's a good guy, no red flags. So he's like a good guy like Johnny Manziel or Deshaun Watson, just teams are ready for him. <laughs> he, he's, yeah, he doesn't, well, I guess, I guess Deshaun didn't actually have any red flags coming out. So he, you never that know. knew about these guys. Yeah. But I will say, <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, but uh, he, by all accounts, is not going to get dinged for that at this point in time. <laughs> So your top five picks are all defensive ends and offensive tackles. Uh, that won't get an average NFL fan too excited. However, that can change a team in a season. Uh, can you give us a sales pitch that should get these fans excited about the players you're having going top five? The sales pitch I give for positions like that, and especially offensive tackle, is to look how much those guys get paid on their second contracts. They get paid $20-plus plus million for average to above average guys in the offense tackle position because there's only about 25 off you know guys in the in the world right now who are six foot five with 34 inch arms that can move and mirror von millers of the world so there's not enough to go around everyone needs one and so if you draft a guy that can offensive tackle if you draft one of those guys top five and he's good you're saving yourself 20 million dollars that you don't have to pay that guy in free agency and again you're getting something that every single team in the NFL needs. And that's why I have them going high is because you can count on one hand, the amount of fan bases that are happy with both of their offensive tackles, their left and right tackle. Yeah. And that's with the NFL today with pass, like passing game as it is, everyone needs that position. So that's, that's my sales pitch for teams who might, or fan bases that might want a sexier position like wide receiver, but invest in the offensive line. It'll pay off dividends. All right, Mike, you're, you're preaching to the choir. I'm a Giants fan. They have the fifth pick. And uh, so talk to me. Are, are we going to have a winning season? <laughs> you know it firsthand then. You've seen they, you know, they sign Kenny Galladay. You draft Kadarius Tony. You think, oh, look at this high-powered offense. And then your quarterback's flat on his back, and it goes, no. That, that, that is why you invest in the O-line first. And then you get those other pieces around, and then all of a sudden it'll start to look good. Now, will they have a winning season? I'm not going to go that far just yet. I, I love the coaching staff, Ooh. the front office, office they've put together there. I do think they're still a few years away. They have to pay for the sins of the past. What Dave Gettleman left there was an abomination, truthfully. The roster mismanagement, the cap mismanagement, how much they're paying mediocre players right now is obviously why he's not there anymore. So I, I think they're still a couple years away, but I believe in this staff to get the job done. Ouch, Giannis. <laughs> I'm not going to come out here and gas your tires, Giannis. I can't lie to you. I can't lie to you. (laughs) It makes for a long season on this show when every week we're we're having to talk about the Giants' struggles. Now, on to a real (laughs) franchise. I'm a Packer fan, and everyone knows that we need receivers. Um, Although, knowing Aaron Rodgers, I don't think he gives trust very quickly to young guys, let alone rookies, and we have the 22nd pick. I know you put Chris Olave there from Ohio State as one of the most pro-ready receivers, but what about filling that need in free agency? What's your overall take on what the Packers are going to do at that position? Oh, man. I, I really wish I could tell you what the Packers are going to do at that position, but I've been wrong so often with them. I'm a Packers fan as well. I'm originally from Milwaukee. Oh, so right. I have been I begging I for a while. I knew I had a little two accent, years. too. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> to go to Milwaukee, yes, yeah. Two years ago, I was like, T. Higgins at the back end of the first round. No mm-hmm. brainer. They go Jordan Love. Last year, I'm like, this is a loaded wide receiver class. They go cornerback. I-, I think this is the year they finally pull the trigger. I mean, they quite literally have to. With Devontae Adams no longer there anymore, they need to just fill out that receiving core. After signing Sammy Watkins, I think they're good there to just, they're going to take one wide receiver in this class. Will it be in the first round, second round? I don't know. But what they have coveted when they do draft wide receivers, which isn't all. The last time they used a the top I believe top 75 pick, it was Devontae Adams back in 2014. They draft size, whether it's, you know, Jordy Nelson, James Jones, throughout their history, those are 200 plus pound type of wide receivers or just thickly built. Even Randall Cobb for a shorter wide receiver is still well built. So that's their type. Guys like, you know, George Pickens, Traylon Burks, George Pickens from Georgia, Traylon Burks from Arkansas, uh, Sky Moore from Western Michigan. Those are guys who fill that mold in terms of the size they usually cover. So those are the names I would keep an eye out. When they do draft wide receiver, I say when, hoping that they do. But yeah. TBD on if they actually follow through on that because, my gosh, on paper right now, that's a bottom three wide receiver core in the NFL. It just makes me very nervous for 
uh, the the remaining years of Aaron because it feels like we kind of missed our window. We could go on a whole Packer tangent right now, but that's what it looks like to me. <laughs> well, that's why I think if I had to pick any two wide receivers, it would be George Pickens or Sky Moore because they have the best hands in the draft class. If he's going to trust a guy who's going to be where he needs to be and has good hands, if he's going to trust anyone out the gate, that's who it would be. But you're 100% correct. Like His MO is two or three years before he's even yeah. looking your way in and off in that offense. So – uh, that's why I think it might it might be ugly out the gate here. Giannis, we're in for a long season. Do you think there's a chance we don't see a skill player drafted in the top ten? I know Keter. Uh, I'm sorry. I know Peter King floated that idea this week. Do you think that's possible? I think it is because of where the strengths this class lie. Whether it's offensive tackle edge, which we just talked about, and then cornerback as well is very strong and very thin compared to wide receiver, where. Wide receivers deeper, and we see it every year. You know, this team's drafting at the top of the draft. Can also find a good guy in the top of the second round, whether it's, I think it was Elijah Moore last year. It was T. Higgins, Michael Pittman two years ago. Debo Samuel even the year before that. Talent still falls at that position that can be game-changing talent into the second round, whereas offensive tackle edge, it doesn't. So I think the teams I would look out, if anyone is going to pull the trigger on a wide receiver, Atlanta at number eight or the Jets at number 10. Those are the two teams. I don't think anyone else is real, even realistically in play to draft. That being said, are there any receivers like the ones you've mentioned who could have an immediate impact like we've seen the last couple of years with a Justin Jefferson, a Jamar Chase, or are those just such rare cases? I think those are rare cases. The wide receiver yeah. one in this class, to me, is Jamison Williams, the Alabama wide receiver. Yeah. He, he, him having the ACL obviously kind of puts that one to bed in terms of him making an immediate impact. Wide receiver two is Drake London from USC. And while I love him translating to the NFL, love his ball skills, the size, he's not very fast. You know, Jefferson ran a 4-4-1, I believe. Jamar Chase was in the 4-3s. Like, those guys were explosive athletes. I think those are more rare cases. I would put this entire wide receiver class behind the top three last year that came off the board and Chase Waddle and Devontae Smith. I, I think all these guys are a step behind them. But there are a lot of guys in that tier that are a step behind. So I think you get some productive guys, but I don't see anyone going 1,200 yards you know, from day one type of number one wide receiver. So Mike, Jamison Williams obviously tore his ACL in the national championship game. There are questions about his health, although guys come back from ACL tears all the time. But he may not be ready by the start of the season. Is that going to hold some teams back? Would that lower his draft status? I think it will some teams, you know, some teams will obviously err on the side of caution when it comes to injuries and look elsewhere, but not too much. I think a lot of people are going to look at kind of the most recent scenario of this where Jeffrey Simmons tore his ACL, the Titans defensive tackle in the pre-draft process, slips to 19, and if you redrafted that draft class, he'd be a top five pick. You know, he's the top defensive tackle easily from that draft class. So I think a lot of teams are regretting that and seeing that the draft is not just a year one decision, it's a long-term decision at this point four months out with the medical rechecks here this month you know or you don't where his recovery is going to go after an ACL you know whether he's going to have complications have issues and which none have been flagged yet which is why I think you've seen him move up boards in mock drafts or not so his timeline puts him towards the middle like realistically early to middle of next season to actually be on a football field but even then I would draft that guy as the wide receiver one in this class I would take him as you know, a top 10 player from the Falcons or the Jets, I'd be willing to pull the trigger on a guy like that because speed like he has, game-breaking speed, it never lasts long in the NFL draft. And compare him to guys like Henry Ruggs or Darius Hayward Bay, who have been top 10 picks in years past, he's got much, much better tape. Don't mean to bring it back to the Giants, but I mean, you know, I'd be remiss if we had you on here and I didn't ask this question. How committed do you think the Giants are to Daniel Jones what do you think they're going to do specifically with their two first-round picks? Are we going to see a replacement coming in? Very uncommitted, I'll say. I think they are <laughs> options wide open. They're going to obviously give him a trial run. You know, you know, they they came in knowing that they were kind of handcuffed to him, you know, in a to a degree. But I don't think you're going quarterback in this year's quarterback class. I think what they're doing is, like I said, they left a rough situation there for the staff. I think they're kind of going to clear house reset this roster, and then try to attract the top talent. We, we've seen quarterbacks on the move more so in the past three years than ever before. Quite literally, the last two Super Bowl champions were quarterbacks that weren't on the roster the year prior with Tom Brady and Matt Stafford. So you can go out and find one if you put together a good situation for them, if you put together a good roster behind, in, around them. So they're going to give Daniel Jones this trial run. 
If it doesn't work out with an improved offensive line, which they should have, obviously drafting an offensive line in top 10, if he is not that guy, if he doesn't look good, he's to the curb and they're looking elsewhere, maybe via trade or wherever they can in next year's draft. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> I got one last question. When these teams are drafting, how much do they look at the grades of the guys? Does that matter at all? Like if a guy's a straight A student, does that matter? Or do they take that into account what he majored in? Like if he majors in, you know, physical therapy or <laughs> sociology, whatever, is there a difference? There, okay, certain teams will care about things like that. And, and a big thing that's an underrated like red flag for some certain teams is if they're like too good a student. If, is if they have too many interests oh, outside on. of football, that starts <laughs> to take guys and drop guys on board. This is not a joke. This is actually dead serious. <laughs> that if a guy is too interested in other things, like if he has strong hobbies outside of football, that will be seen as a negative and a red flag in certain people's eyes. So you got to hit that sweet spot of not loving other stuff too much, but not caring too little. You have to be right in the middle of how much you care about, you know, other things in life. But you got to love football at the end of the day. He's right. It's the NFL. He's, it's the NFL. They don't care. <laughs> you know, all I'm hearing, I'm having a son in about three weeks, and I'm just going to make sure he has no other interests. It's all sports, baby. No time for games. <laughs> this is not. He's going to be a top five pick. He's going to be a no, top in, five in pick. In all seriousness, my, uh, my husband was drafted in the NBA, but he, we just were having this conversation, and he said that some NBA teams – called local bar owners in Madison, Wisconsin, to ask what kind of guy Sam was. And that they ended up telling him, yeah, I told him you never had an issue, you know, never were in a fight, never stiffed your tab, nothing like that. But boy, do they do their research. And like the movie Draft Day, like we see it ended up coming down to players not being invited to a birthday party. That's a, a lot of area scouts are more private investigator than they are yeah. like evaluator of talent for these teams. Like they have to dig into backgrounds to find stuff more than just like, tell me how good this guy is on tape. No, the report is all like background information, talking to people around them, seeing just who the guy is. So it's a, it's, it's a big investment. You know, they're paying these guys a lot of money. You got to be smart about it to a degree. Do they check yeah. the social media profiles too, to see what they're posting and stuff like that? Oh yeah. Sometimes. I mean, some, there's some guys that have slipped through though with some rough stuff. I remember Geronimo <laughs> Allison. You probably remember this yeah. uh, Packers UDFA. <laughs> yeah. He had tweeted some, I don't know if I should say it, but he tweeted some sexually explicit stuff, shall we say, uh, prior to getting drafted. That was still pops up or still did pop up when he was still in the NFL. <laughs> like how'd they miss that? How did they miss that? Um, I have another quarterback question. Some Can of these, some of these agents though, I mean, like, it's the agents that usually tell them to scrub that stuff. But, like, a lot of the agents, yeah. especially for, like, smaller-time guys, are trying to just, like, cast a wide net. And they're agents for a lot of different players. And so they don't get a lot of attention from that agent. And they don't know what the hell they're doing. You know, pre-draft, they're just trying to catch on somewhere. So. Right. Okay. That slips through the cracks. <laughs> Geronimo Allison. Yeah, I had forgotten about that until you brought that up. Okay, I have one more quarterback question. Will we see Baker Mayfield move? On draft day, what's the latest with him? What are you hearing from teams who might be interested? So I'm hearing no one's interested is the thing. It's why they're really wow. struggling here because of how his contract is set up. So it's a fifth year option, which is now guaranteed when you exercise it, but it's not guaranteed or it doesn't hit your cap if that guy's traded. So it's $18 million. If they cut him outright, they have to pay him $18 million this year. If they trade him, they don't have to take any of that cap hit. The new team that traded for him pays that $18 million. So there's only maybe a couple teams in the NFL right now that would even consider it. The thing is, one of them is the Pittsburgh Steelers, who's in the division, who they obviously would have no interest in really trading him to as a division rival. But they can kind of basically say, hold him hostage or hold the Browns hostage and say, you know, you're going to have to give us picks to give to us to take Baker Mayfield because wow. it's going to... you have an active interest in wanting him off your team because of that cap hit. So I think that could be what we end up seeing is they actually trade away picks and Baker Mayfield to have another team take Baker Mayfield, whether it's the Seahawks or someone else who's a quarterback needy team, maybe the Carolina Panthers, if they don't draft quarterback in the top 10. So I think that's where it's at. Even if Baker Mayfield like objectively still should be one of the 32 starting quarterbacks in the NFL, like when he is good and healthy, 
he is better than that. It's just everyone kind of found their quarterback, and the Browns missed the boat. That's brutal. He's got a good agent, though. I mean, he's got a good agent because he did a lot of commercials. His commercial ratio Good marketing to, agent. Yeah, yeah, he's got a great marketing agent because I was saying, like, why is he in so many commercials? He's not that great. He's a little bit of a squeak. He can't even see over the offensive line. They should have did a commercial about that, about stretching him out a little bit. He's a little person. <laughs> I was going to say, all those ones where it's, he's living at the Brown Stadium, probably a yeah. little awkward right now. If he's still living there. <laughs> uh, he's probably. <laughs> Very awkward. Okay, Mike, one last thing. Right. Can you leave us with a hot take on something you're predicting happens on draft night? Something that might be a little out there unexpected. Maybe someone take. trading up. I, I'm bad at I'm bad at doing hot takes. I will just say that <laughs> I, I think the hottest take I have is that the Detroit Lions end up selecting a quarterback in this class. I, oh. I think Detroit, with kind of where they are as a roster, and you know, with Jared Goff is kind of this lame duck year where they can't really cut him because the cap hit, but like still want him on the roster. I think they draft quarterback at number two overall and let him develop. And I think it's going to be Malik Willis. So that's my hot take is Malik Willis goes number Whoa. two overall. That's a great hot take, actually. You said you don't do hot takes, but that one was sizzling, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at them because they don't come true is more what I was saying. My hot takes right. are pretty trash. Yeah. Well, you know, you got, you got a nice chain out there. I like your chain. I, did, I wanted to wait to the end of the interview to say that's, that's a nice <laughs> ice you got right there. I got mine, Appreciate too. It, I, pulled my, I pulled mine out because you had yours out. Yeah. <laughs> Chain break, chain gang. <laughs> Not bad, Giannis, for a white guy from Wisconsin, huh? <laughs> Not bad at all. Not bad at all. Wisconsin boys yeah. got swag now that they really, Wisconsin boys do not have swag, sadly. No. Yeah, you guys both look like you're from the Midwest. I, I look like, I feel like I'm in a, I'm on a German chat right now with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mike, you're a trooper. <laughs> thanks so much for coming no, thank on. you guys for, you having follow us. Hey, for having me on mike renner yeah. at pff underscore mike thanks so much for all the great insight and we're really looking forward to seeing how much of this you got right next week although you've predicted none of it so this will be great thanks mike <laughs> thank you i am looking forward to it too tbd undefined this is all probably going to turn out to be wrong but it was fun <laughs>